leadership, um, you might probably be asking, as some people do, I mean, the country is in a place of turmoil and crisis, and so we decide we're going to have a series on worship. I mean, put your head in the clouds, right, so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good, that kind of stuff. But actually, we were reminded uh, that God is journeying with this nation, and He's journeying with us as a congregation. The first responsibility of leadership is actually to define reality. Guys, what realities are we dealing with? And how do we deal with them? That's the first responsibility of, uh, responsibility of leadership. So what we did in the month of August as leaders, we took you through the book of Ephesians just to remind you who God is, what He's done, and how, that, how you fit into what God is busy doing. We want, so often we want God to fit into what we think is supposed to happen, but what we need to do is to make sure that we understand who God is, what He's doing, and how we fit into His plan and purposes irrespective of what's happening in the nation or the community. That's the first step. From there on out, of course, it's time then to respond appropriately to who He is uh, so that now we're stepping into a season where we're going to give you handles on what it means to live a lifestyle of worship from a place of revelation, from a place like Isaiah, understanding, seeing who He is and what He's busy doing and saying and responding to that appropriately. Then we're going to go in the month of October. How do we take this intimate relationship and quality of relationship that we have with God into our everyday work, lifestyle, away from just me and God, into community and processes that are running there? So October, that's where, we're going to, where the tire is going to hit the tar, and we're going to take you into that in a few weeks' time. But for now, the, uh, the focus for these next few weeks is on worship. And this morning, we're going to talk about worship being a response to revelation. Now, I know uh, revelation is probably not everyday language for most people. And when we use the word revelation, those who do know the Bible think, okay, it's all about beasts and dragons and angels and all sorts of chains and pits and fiery lakes and furnace and what have you. It, that's revelation. No, no. That may be the book of Revelation or the, the revelation that John had in terms of how the end times and how God's purposes in all of the earth are going to be working out. That's not where we're going. I want to remind you of uh, Proverbs 29 verse 18. Isaiah remembers Solomon's wisdom in Proverbs 29 18. Where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, that's the amplified that I'm giving you, the amplified version, where there's no vision or redemptive revelation of God, the people perish. You see, when you don't see or you don't know or you don't acknowledge who God is and what He's busy doing and how He has set things up to work, you make decisions that are actually disruptive to yourself and to those around you. Isaiah was in a season of disruption. Isaiah 6, we read about that. The nation was in turmoil. The leader of the nation who was actually positive about church, about God, about the law, about government, he was very positive about the way God had set things up to work. That leader passed away. And the one who followed him up was, uh, man, okay, let's not go there. <laughs> he was a scoundrel to the nth degree, and Isaiah knew this nation is now on a downward spiral. And he went into the temple, went to church, the church of his day. He went into the temple and he sat before the Lord and he started, in a sense, asking, so where do we go from here? We can't allow this to happen to this nation. Lord, where are you? What's happening? And in that moment, he gets a revelation. He gets to see with his spirit what is actually happening in the heavenly realm. Now, we probably think heaven is like up there and earth down here, kind of, you know, that disparity. But from God's perspective, earth is part of His world. What happens here is part of what He is watching over and dealing with. So we might feel that distance, but God doesn't feel that distance. So he's hearing, Isaiah is hearing the angels around the throne singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of hosts. And, and he, Isaiah, the prophet, the spiritual leader, is saying, Oh yes, right on, God is holy, God is different, God is pure, God is wonderful. But then the angelic hosts or the four living creatures around the throne, they begin to sing another song. They add on to that, the whole earth. It's full of His glory. Isaiah 
experiences this moment of cognitive dissonance. What his spirit knows to be true, God is holy. And what his physical senses and his daily experiences telling him, here is chaos. Suddenly these two can't, they don't match. When the angels say the whole earth is full of his glory, it's like Isaiah saying, hey guys, you're not seeing what I'm seeing. Guys, you're not hearing what I'm hearing. Uh, I know you guys are not on Facebook, but guys, really, how can, you, how can you say the whole earth is full of his glory? I mean, from down here, and that's not true. I can't agree with that. You know, sometimes when God is busy, there is a reality that he is dealing with that we just need to tap into to be able to understand why he says what he says. His perspective and our perspective need to align so that when he says what he says, that is actually we are in agreement with what he is saying because we're seeing what he is seeing. That's what revelation is all about. Being able to grasp, being able to see, to discern what God is busy seeing and saying and doing. That's the important thing about revelation. That's what revelation actually is. There's an external reality that our physical senses make us aware of. There's an internal reality, our emotions, our thought processes, what we value, what we desire. And then there is an eternal reality that is unmoved by what's happening here on earth and is unmoved by what I want. When I say unmoved, hear me in context. What I want God to do and what God is intending to do through me are not always the same thing. It's important that I get my desires, my thoughts, my choices, my values in alignment with His. But we'll go into that at a different stage. So what Revelation is all about is that we get to perceive, to see, to grasp, to understand what God is busy saying and doing. The Reality that is eternal cannot be seen with the natural eye, but it can be seen with the heart. It can be seen with the eyes of the Spirit. And that's what Paul has been praying. We went through it a few weeks ago. Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. Uh, here we have, I'm bringing it to you in the Amplified, Ephesians 1, 17 to 19. Paul says, I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that He may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, of insight into mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of Him by having the eyes of your heart flooded with light. Revelation is seeing with the eyes of your heart, seeing with the eyes of your spirit, not just the eyes of your soul or your mind. That's where revelation comes into this. And when you see what God is busy saying and doing, guess what happens? Something shifts on the inside of you and you begin to agree with God. You begin to communicate from a whole different place. You begin to make decisions from a whole different place. You begin to align your life with His Word. Now, I've invited Vilmi to join me from time to time. She's going to just be providing some sound in the background. Um, as we go through this, I'd like us just to pause in those cellar moments, think through, and maybe respond in your own words uh, for a moment or two, and she's just going to be in the background while that is happening. So the first thing I want to bring this morning, having done that by way of introduction, is I think we need to realize that the origin of the English word helps us a little bit in our posture when it comes to worship. The word worship comes from the English, English word worth-ship. It has to do with worth. It has to do with value. It has to do with how highly respected and prized the object of your worship is. It's got to do with responding appropriately to the worth of the one with whom we engage. When you come into the presence of majesty, there's a protocol because of the worth or the value or the importance of the individual with whom you are engaging. 
um, they, they tell me, and I've never been in that situation, they tell me that um, when you're in the presence of royalty, you always wait for them to choose the topic of discussion, and then you respond to that. I wouldn't know. I've never been in that position. But when, I think that's a fairly good rule to apply when it comes to God, who is the King of kings, the Lord of lords. When you come into His presence, allow Him to set the topic of conversation and respond to Him. We so often walk into His presence demanding, decreeing, declaring, expecting, imposing our will on His that by the time we're finished with what we want to say, what he wants to say doesn't get said because we're on our way again. We vented and now God has to deal with it. Uh, that's not worship. That's not quality relationship. That's a totally different picture. This is not what worship is all about. I remember <laughs> talking about inappropriate. I was, I was head boy at school, uh, high school, and it was... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not saying that to drag a cheer. I'm saying that just to compound the magnitude of the, of the problem. Um, a friend of mine, we were sitting in the quadrangle early one morning, and the headmaster walked past, and he stuck his head into the door. It was the inner quadrangle, and he said, and he started talking to us. And we remained seated, and he walked up to us, and he, started, and he was carrying on a conversation with us, and we were sitting there chatting to him like, I mean, buddies, you know? The headmaster was a very laid-back guy. He wasn't the stickler for, uh, you know, it has to be done a certain way. So culturally, um, he was kind of laid back. So we, you know, this is fine. The headmaster's talking to us. Hey, cool, man. And then when he walked away, the vice principal walked in. And when the vice principal walked in, we shot up, you know, <laughs> realizing because he was the one, you know, stickler for discipline. And then he looked at us and he said, how dare you? What have we done? What have we done? How dare you remain seated when the headmaster is speaking to you? And we realized, yeah, the headmaster, I mean, vice principal, we're up to attention when the VP walks in, but the headmaster, hey, cool, yeah, Mr. Smith, okay, yeah. And I realized <laughs> I was setting a poor example to the school by doing that. But the inappropriate response to me then suddenly clicked, and I realized the worth, the value, the importance of that individual. And my response to him was entirely inappropriate. I had occasion to apologize to him later that day when we saw each other for a meeting. But that actually came and cemented something for me in my relationship with God. Yes, he is my father. But the worth of who he is should draw from me the appropriate response to the majesty of who he is, the greatness of who he is. You see, worship has more to do with the nature of the object being worshipped than the inclination of the one who is worshipping. In the Ten Commandments, the first two have to do with appropriately responding to who God is. He says in the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Anything other than him. To worship that would be inappropriate. In the second commandment, he says, don't worship any representation of me. Why? Because anything other than God and anything that is a representation of God, they're both less than who he is. Neither are worth my worship. He alone is worth my worship. And for those of you who are into this, the whole Ten Commandments thing, he actually connects that to being a jealous God and that kind of, you know, cognitive dissonance, gears are on, is scratching, God is jealous. But jealousy is petty. We know that mature people are not jealous. We know that mature people love, in a sense, unconditionally. They don't get jealous. So why is God jealous? Why is God so petty? No, it's got nothing to do with pettiness. When you truly value something, you want to protect and preserve what you value. And you want to protect and preserve it from other things that want to disrupt. Anything other than God will disrupt you. Anything less than God will disrupt you when you choose to worship it. So the jealousy that he has is about your well-being, not about the fact that he's not getting worship. God doesn't want worship. Okay, now that... For some of you, now's cognitive dissonance. God doesn't want worship. 
God is not looking for worship. Do you think the angels and the saints that have gone on before are giving him a substandard performance in heaven? Do you think what's happening on earth is like light years, leagues ahead of what's happening in heaven? So God is putting heaven. Oh, guys, come on, can it, man? Come on, guys, really. Let's listen to this church. Do you think that's what's happening? Do you think God wants worship? Do you think God wants to feel, oh, let me hear it. Come on, tell me about me. No. God is not petty. God is not childish. God is not immature. God doesn't want worship. What God is looking for is an intimate encounter with someone who loves him for who he is, not for what they can get out of him. That is the essence of worship. Acknowledge him for his worth. God is satisfied with nothing less than that which is godly. God is satisfied with nothing less than that which reflects himself. And when you come and you love God for who he is, you are reflecting back to him something of his selfless nature in worship. And that is what he enjoys. He enjoys you when you worship him. Take a moment and let's just quickly consider the things that we consider to be building blocks for our lives. Let's bring this declaration before him this morning. Lord, you alone are worthy of our worship. And I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. I will build my life upon your love. It is a firm foundation. I will put my trust in you alone. And I will not be shaken. Oh, yes, Lord, you're worthy. Let's sing that verse together, shall we? Worthy, worthy, Jesus. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. You're worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, yes, Jesus. You have the name above every other name. Jesus, the name above every other name. nothing else that's worthy there's no one else that's worthy no representation of you no alternative to you can ever be worth our worship we acknowledge you for who you are you see worship is responding to what he says about himself not what we think is appropriate necessarily, but what he says about himself stirs that response. I love what C.S. Lewis says about this whole thing of responding to that which is admirable, beautiful, powerful, that which stirs a response. He says, when we say a picture is admirable, what we mean to say is that admiration is the correct 
or the adequate or the appropriate response to it. That if we do not admire, we shall be stupid, insensible, great losers, and we shall have missed something. In that way, many objects, both in nature and in art, may be said to deserve or merit or demand admiration. Then he makes the switch, makes the connection. God is that object to admire which, or if you like to appreciate which, is simply to be awake, to have entered the real world, not to appreciate, which is to have lost the greatest experience, and in the end, to have lost all. It is in the process of being worshipped that God communicates His presence to men. In commanding us to praise Him, God is actually inviting us to enjoy Him. You see, if we are honest and consistent with this train of thought people who do not worship are not healthy people who do not worship are not in the real world you see people who do not worship are normally self-centered and self-centered people we know are unhappy because they were not designed for a life centered around self. Your life was designed to be centered around something far more significant than just you. If this is where you're at, if you're not worshiping, if worship is a, oh, it's an issue or a hassle, I want you to know this morning you're not healthy. You need to find healing, restoration. Somebody once said, dignity is not a fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> if you have a problem with expressing worship, if your dignity is more important than your expressive worship, I suggest you consider where that attitude was birthed and deal with it. <laughs> You've probably heard people who have told you, I really didn't enjoy worship today. I've heard it a couple of times. My response, it's okay. We weren't worshiping you. <laughs> so <laughs> the question is, did he enjoy worship today? Because it's actually, as Laguna led us in singing, it's all about him. It's all about him. Let me put worship then in context and wrap it up this morning. And obviously, when I say wrap it up, you know a preacher, when he says that, is telling you he has at least 15 minutes left. But <laughs> I don't know where, how far this is going to go. But let, let's imagine that we are on this road trip. Um, I'm behind the wheel. You're in the car with me. We're traveling, and we're going through this lane of trees. Um, I tried to give you an idea of more or less what I think it could look like. Uh, but if you have a better picture in your mind, close your eyes and see yourself there. Okay, we're driving and we're driving and it's a long, tour, long trip. It's nice and it's pleasant. But for a long time, we're like in this canopy of green, this tunnel of green. Uh, and it's beautiful. It's lovely. And we're enjoying it. But then in a moment, like we come around this corner and suddenly all the trees are gone. And we're seeing the countryside just open up ahead of us. And it's like fields and lakes far in the distance and hazy in the distance there's a mountain or two there tucked away under the cloud in the mist and you see this panorama opening up in front of you i don't know about you but my first response to something like that is normally wow wow <laughs> wow isn't that awesome now that yeah okay we'll get there in a moment all right so coming around the corner discovering that thing is like seeing for the first time that which was always there, but which you couldn't see because you were unfortunately unable to see it. But now that you are able to see it, that, that experience or that incident, that moment is probably what Scripture calls prophecy. It's bringing a revelation to you so that you can discover, that you can see, that you can grasp, 
are. This is the reality that is actually there without me being able to see it. That moment is what we call prophecy. The Psalms are full of it. Scripture is full of it. Remember Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. It's David suddenly making that switch or that, that discovery of, but just as I am a shepherd to my sheep, God is a shepherd to me. That revelation trips a whole bunch of stuff, knocks a whole bunch of stuff into process. So that prophecy or that revelation normally does something to you on the inside. The psalmist puts it this way, Psalm 23 verse 1, The Lord is my shepherd. That's prophecy. That's revelation. The very next sentence, I shall not want. He's not the shepherd I don't want. Be, want is lack, right? The Lord is my shepherd, therefore I lack nothing. How does it make you feel to know that you are fully resourced for anything and everything that he considers important? That must do something to you on the inside. Psalm 27, verse 1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. The very next sentence, whom shall I fear? The Lord is my strength, of whom shall I be afraid? You see, prophecy always produces ministry. Prophecy will always, the revelation of who God is and what He is doing will always do something to you on the inside. And when that happens, your most natural, logical response is, wow, worship. Praise, worship is inner health made audible. It tells people around you that you've discovered something about God. And that you're, that response tells people around you, ah, oh, you're seeing it, you've heard it, you've grasped it. Okay, back to our picture now. Come around the corner. See, my first response, obviously, I'm seeing this. It does something on the inside. I respond, wow, what is my very next response? As driver, I would probably want to ask my passenger, are you seeing this? Are you seeing this too? You know, the Psalms are full of this whole thing of, uh, come, let us, in, let us go up to the house of the Lord. Let us worship together. Let us, it's, it's like he's pretty demanding. Some of the worship leaders up here can be demanding as well. Let's do the, let's magnify, let's lift up, let's, and you feel, hey, buddy, don't pressure me. I'll do what I want to do when I do it, okay? But he's not pressuring you. All he's doing is he's, naturally responding and inviting you to enjoy what he's busy experiencing. That is what we call the celebration of life. That's why when we come together as a congregation, we come together to celebrate the life that God has put in us. Celebrate the quality of life that we're enjoying in his presence. So the invitation is there to engage, not so that we can, all right, get yourself out of your last week. Get yourself ready for next week. Come on, let's worship. No, no, it's got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with enjoying together who God is and what He's busy doing. Okay, put yourself in my place. I've been chauffeur to some people who cannot see, blind people. And I've been in kind of situations where, like this, I come around the corner, see this. It does something in me, and I say, wow, my very next response is, hey, can you see this? And I realize, mm, mm, mm. <laughs> that would be inappropriate. But in response to my, wow, the blind person next to me starts asking, what? What are you seeing? Why are you saying that? So my, obviously, my response is going to be, man, I've been praying a long time for this opportunity. You need to know, because you're blind, there's so much stuff in this world that you're not seeing. And you need to get healed from your blindness so that you can start seeing what we see. Now, nah. something inside of you started cringing when I was doing that. Why? Because you know, people who are blind are not necessarily blind because they choose to be blind. People who are blind need to be assisted we need to communicate to people who are not seeing what we are seeing. We need to communicate in such a way that they desire to want to be included in what we are experiencing and seeing. So evangelism is not telling people if they don't repent, they're going to go to hell. 
Evangelism is sharing with people what we have discovered about the life, the joy, the truth, the value of who God is and how it has changed our lives. Prophecy will always stir ministry. Ministry should always flow over into worship. Worship normally flows over into the celebration of life. And whether it's in church, uh, in a Sunday setting, or uh, at the picnic, we're going to celebrate life. We're going to enjoy the good things that God has shared with us. Celebrate life. And then for people who don't know that or haven't experienced that, evangelism is sharing with them in such a way that they want to be part of this family. So where does worship fit in? Worship, like marriage, parenting, it's responding to a discovery that leaves you changed. It takes you into transformation. It transforms the nature of who you are. It changes the way you see yourself and others. Psalm 17, 15. I love the way David puts this. He says, as for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness now this is this this is the outflow or the spontaneous response to what worship is all about beholding his face but he says i will behold your face in righteousness now that righteousness the hebrew word there has to do with a, a scale that is balancing that is perfectly balanced it means that the weight or the worth that is on the one side and the weight or the worth that is on the other side are equal so when we behold his face we behold him in righteousness. We behold him as equals. God engages us and brings us to a place of being his equal so that we can intimately engage with him without any discomfort, without any guilt or whatever it might be keeping us from full engagement with him. I will behold his face as an equal in righteousness. Equal weight, equal worth. Somebody once asked me, do you think God loves me as much as he loves Jesus? I said, he loves you more. Why? How can God love me more than he loves Jesus? Well, the price he paid for you, he was willing to give up Jesus so that he doesn't have to give you up. What does that tell you about how he values you? The worth that he places on you. He wants us to engage with him from that place. That's true worship. He says, when I awake, I will be satisfied with your likeness. The mirror image, same kind, same nature, same quality. Worship. Let's just land with this quote from C.S. Lewis, Reflections on the Psalms. Just as men spontaneously praise whatever they value, so they spontaneously urge us to join them in praising it. The psalmist, in telling everyone to praise God, they're doing what all men do when they speak of what they care about. We delight to praise what we enjoy because the praise not merely expresses but completes the enjoyment. The delight is incomplete Till it is expressed the worthier the object the more intense this delight would be let's take a moment just as we land this I want Gerard to come and share with us something that he saw during prayer that so lines up with the essence of what worship is and the effect of what worship can bring. Morning, family. Um, this morning, when we were praying, I saw uh, what I believe was a vision. If you've ever seen uh, dominoes being stacked, um, in a, in a pattern and one domino falls and you see how dominoes just 
rolls out and you can see this pattern. What I think what God showed me this morning uh, in perspective was uh, a domino and then I was zoomed out and I could see actually the whole earth with this pattern of dominoes and the first one fell. Now, when the dominoes are stacked, they've got potential energy. And the first domino that fell was the potential that was being released and, and enabled other dominoes to also fall and create this, this beautiful picture of what the potential was, I believe, that God has created. Now, what I was saying to Rick, that sometimes I feel, what can I do if I look at the magnitude of the problems that we are faced in South Africa and... Um, and that wants you to hold back. And I felt what God said to me this morning is just fall. Just release the energy that I've given you. Yes, yes. Thank you, Father. Thank you. Whenever we change our position, so we unleash potential. We unlock potential. We're going to play a video clip now that tells us something about the change in our position and how it changes our perspective and in fact sets us up to be able to see the way God sees and to engage with what God has called us to engage. Thank you. There's a, a beautiful painting that's uh, hung in a, one of the art galleries in London. And there's a whole floor that's given over to Italian Renaissance paintings. When I was a student in London, I used to go and there were one or two paintings that I would just literally sit and look at the beautiful detail. But there's a painting by an Italian Renaissance painter. He painted this beautiful oil of Christ being held by his mother. And it's quite a large painting and it's hung in this gallery. And there's a very famous British art critic, his name is Robert Cummings. And he describes a day where he goes to that particular art gallery and he stands in front of that painting and he looks at it. And even though he can recognize the skill of the brushstroke, the beauty of the color, he wrote there's something wrong with this painting. The angle of the mother, the way she's holding her baby, the hills, in the background, something's just not right here. And he stood there, it was a very busy day in the art gallery, and he surveyed the painting for some time. And then this thought came to him. What if this was never meant to be hung in an art gallery? What if this painting was meant to be hung in a place of prayer? So this very well-dressed, very well-known art critic did something that he says he's never done before in his life. He got down on his knees in the art gallery in front of the painting and he looked up and it changed everything. He realized this was not a painting that was supposed to be stood and stared at. This was a painting that had, had been commissioned to be seen through the eyes of worship from that place on his knees as he gazed up everything about the painting had changed mary was holding the baby close the hills were in the background everything was beautiful because he changed his stance and honestly that's my prayer for us this year we can stand and stare at our world and all we're gonna see is what's wrong. We're gonna see what everybody's doing wrong, how they're expressing it wrongly. How would it change your life? How would it change my life if we viewed this world instead from a position of worship? If we got on our knees before we ever headed out the door on any given day would we begin to see this world with the eyes of Christ?